Hey everybody, I'm Noah Cairns, and like Dr. Shannon said, I'm here to talk to you about the toxicity of perfection. Now what exactly do I mean by that? I mean when we try to strive for an objective perfection that's this abstract idea in our head, and we can't grasp it, we only end up causing damage to our own psyches. That doesn't stop any of us from trying for it though. Like when we're writing that review of our favorite album, we want it to fully capture the essence of it. Or when we're making that turkey on Thanksgiving, we want it to be absolutely perfect for our family. Or lastly, when we've been working our whole season, our whole career, to perfect that last meet, that last race, we want there to be no flaws on it. Now, I was always told that if you worked hard enough at something, you would always be able to accomplish it. I kind of take issue with this assertion now. I used to be obsessed with this image of my head, in my head, where I was just this perfect thing in anything I was doing. Noah the perfect athlete, Noah the perfect student, Noah the perfect whatever. For you to get an idea of this glowing image, picture uh, <coughs> Michelangelo's David, uh, you know, my face on it. But importantly, I saw this image as ultimately achievable as long as I put in the work I needed to. Now here's an important distinction I want to make. I said that objective perfection can be really harmful for us and tear away at our motivations and health. But I think subjective perfection is incredibly helpful and pushes us all forward as people. Now this distinction is personal and depends on you, so I would like to give a personal example. Here's a source image of that excellent Photoshop from earlier. We took this picture in the rain. You can see Greg is freaking stoked about it. <laughs> but so last year, I was fortunate enough to be elected as one of the captains of the swim team. And immediately the perfect part of my brain just started screaming at me. I wanted to be the perfect leader, 100% in the pool every day, listening to all the guys and leading myself and my team to incredible successes. As hard as I would try, I could not grasp this. I legitimately brought myself to tears talking to my friends because as hard as I would try, I could not be this perfect leader. This fact ate away at me inside. I would have routine two hour nights of sleep. I'd have a strong cup of coffee in the morning and I'd show up to morning practice. My anxiety, my depression, my insomnia all came back with a renewed force like I had not seen before. Picture this juicy, shiny red apple and then you take a bite inside and you see the insides rotting away. Predictably, I broke. I was put on heavy anti-anxiety medications and sleep aids. Notably, one of them was Klonopin. Klonopin is a benzodiazepine, for those who don't know, is the same class of drugs as Xanax. When I would take it for roughly 12 hours, my brain would be free from the chaos it was inflicting on itself. For 12 hours, it would be quiet, and I could sleep, and it was serene. Some of you can see where this is going, but I became dependent on it. I would take more as my tolerance went up, and then rinse and repeat. There I am, captain student athlete, essentially addicted to benzos, still trying to do it all. Predictably, again, I broke. My dependence started rearing an ugly head with visual disturbances, crippling dizziness, the inability to sleep without it, and my first panic attack. This panic attack happened in the guy's locker room where everyone else was having a meeting, and then they all walked back in and saw me in one of my most vulnerable moments ever. I then had to take a month off of the sport I loved, away from the team I loved, in order to get my life back on track. So how did I do it? When I was coming off of Klonopin, I had to create a new mindset for myself. I had to be happy with my daily successes, because every week that I would taper down off the drug, the withdrawal symptoms would come back and hit me in the <coughs> face again. I had to be happy with the little footsteps that I was taking forward. For example, there was a day where I could not make myself shower. There's just no way. I got up and rinsed my face anyway. There was a day when I wasn't swimming that I should have gone for a run, but I couldn't, so I went and took a walk. It's these little footsteps and being happy with them each part of the way that helped me get back to where I wanted to be and proudly finish off my career at the senior night meet against Duke. Now, during this whole process, sure, I wasn't chiseling away at my own marble to become David but I was coming back to being Noah. I think it's incredibly important that we have to ground ourselves. When I was at 10% of the capacity of things that I wanted to do, I wasn't gonna kid myself and say I should be at 100. But that happens to us all the time. 
when we're at 50%, 70%, we want to push we want to push through and hit that threshold that we think we should be all the time. We miss it, we end up getting sick, injured, depressed, anxious about our performance and create a nasty reinforcement cycle. I want everyone to realize that it's okay to be at whatever you are for the day. Only you define your perfect. Now, it's natural for you to ask that if you heard about my deal with objective perfection, deal if you will, and um, how I clawed my way out of it using this subjective ideal, but how does this help us when we're actually healthy? Well, the truth of the matter is that this happens to us all the time. It's an idea that we need to establish. So when I was healthy again, and I was able to train regularly, and I was competing, it was time for me to start a traditional taper process for swimming. For those of you who don't know, tapering is where you essentially drop out your yardage for a couple of weeks, banking and hoping on that all the yardage, all the work you did in the season before is going to be there, and it's going to carry you through inordinate successes. My final meet, my final swim, my climactic moment, and I, by all rights, I am criminally undertrained. Instead of freaking out about this like I think I would have before, I just kind of relaxed and I sank into it. There's nothing I can change now. Sure, I'm at 50% of what I normally am, but damn it, I'm going to give 100% of that 50%. <coughs> now, this mentality helped me go two season best times and one lifetime best time in the meet against Duke. I think that when you own your flaws and you accept your shortcomings, it's going to help you far more than freaking out about them in the moment ever will. <coughs> Don't be perfect. No one is. Be whatever your 100% is. Thank you.